Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to tell you about this podcast. It's called The DK Project, but it's really The Darren Show. The DK Project is a radio show, but without the radio. So sit back, buckle up, and enjoy the ride. Let's go! Welcome back, Project listeners, to another episode of The DK Project. On today's episode, we have Colin Bressler zooming in. He is a horror filmmaker. Pretty interesting stuff. He's got a new film out called Remy's Demons. You're going to want to check that out. Hit the link below and jump on over there. Give him a follow. Check uh, check all of his other works out. I think he said he had like six movies out. Pretty interesting dude. He's also a cameraman on reality TV shows. So we jump into that a little bit. It's an interesting interview. You're not going to want to miss it. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the DK Project, Colin Bresler. It's that time again, folks. Time to enjoy summer. And what's more summer than ice cream? The Lost Lake Creamery is open. We have made some changes for your safety during these difficult times, but we still have 24 flavors of ice cream, shakes, malts, and root beer floats. Check out our new website at lostlakecreamery.com. You can bike, boat, walk, drive, however you want to get here. We are located at 5575 Shoreline Drive, just off the Dakota Bike Trail in the Harbor District of Mound, at the end of the Lost Lake Channel on the north end of Cooks Bay of Lake Minnetonka. Open every day. Stop in and see us today. And remember, ice cream fixes everything. All right, podcast listeners. Welcome back to the DK Project. Today we got a special guest on the Zoom Loom Loom. Uh, Mr. Colin Bressler, uh, movie director extraordinaire. What uh what are we talking about here? You you've got some big things happening, man. You uh got some projects in the works. What uh, what are you up to? Well, thank you. Yeah. First off, thanks for having me. I'm super psyched to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a independent filmmaker, no budget independent filmmaker, <laughs> key, key, di- key, key distinction. Uh, I always find a need to have to say that, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I've been making films, uh, for about eight years, roughly, um, in terms of, um, my independent film career and uh yeah i mean it's going really well i have um i've made six six feature length films two documentaries and and four uh narrative features and the other three narrative features i've made are on amazon prime and available to watch and and this new one remy's demons uh that i have coming out is um is available on amazon prime and and a couple other spots barnes and nobles.com for uh uh dvd purchase but um, we're just we're like right at the precipice of the streaming. It's just that we, you know, once you make a film, you kind of hand it over to third party uh, distributors and then they put it online. So we're at we're sort of at their beck and call. How, we're how does that whole just, thing work? How do you go from I put a movie together with no budget, film the whole thing. How does it turn into now it's on Amazon? Like, how does that happen? So, you know, what's cool is um, nowadays, um, you know, I, I started, I started my career in the nineties. And so way back then there was, that was it, you know, digital just started to happen, but it was like, really didn't look great, looked very video-y. And, um, and anyway, so it was hard to get a film distributor back then. You had to go through the film circuit, the film festival circuit. Nowadays, what's cool is that you, um, you make a film such as mine, right? And then um, I do a little bit of the film festival run because that's about exposure and networking and meeting other filmmakers. But um, the best way to do it, my advice is, is that, or how I've done it is, you know, you take your film and you sort of just market it directly to distribution companies. Um, by sending them screeners, just like I had sent you a screener, yeah. same thing, you know? So when you're done your film, you put, you put a little uh, watermark on it for your production company ownership, and then you just send it around and, um, and you hope it sticks. Uh, and a lot of times people do get distribution through film festivals. Obviously that's great too, because you're, they're coming to you cause they saw it and they're like, Hey, I want that movie. Um, but that hasn't been my experience. My experience is more of like the grassroots sort of like finding companies that are excited. And in the case of me, um, way back, I did a, like a, a no, one of my first films with a no budget film called sleepover. And I dry sort of sent it out to anyone I could find horror. Com- it's a horror film. Yeah. And, uh, scream time films was one of the few that got back to me and they were interested in, I liked talking to them. I liked their vibe. and you know, the rest is history. That's who's distributed uh, three of my four movies. Are, they, are, you, are we staying, are we, we're horror films? That's where we're at? 
all all of them uh, thus far? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're 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 kind of like grades of horror, right? So um, I know that you know it's yeah. I mean, they're, they're they're all in the horror genre. They're just they're just very different sort of takes on it. But but yeah, I mean, I, I stay in that niche because I I really like it. I, I think the audience is awesome and and it's a great little place to explore like the genre of cinema. It's kind of an awesome and and it it lends itself to no budget filmmaking more than than other genres of film. Well, and what are you getting, uh, what are you getting for a response? Like, what are people saying? What, what's, uh, are they, are they hitting? Are they, are they, you know, uh, obviously you probably get numbers on how this is moving, how that's moving. How is the actual, uh, numbers getting out there? Cause obviously you're, you're legging this thing yourself and you've got, uh, it sounds like you got all the right streaming people involved, but, uh, how, how how are you getting to the the people other than podcasts and, and whatnot? Is it, is it spreading? Is it a, is it a thing? I mean, it's so hard to um, pinpoint who's downloading, who's watching whatever. Uh, but are you getting numbers back that people are, are digging the, uh, the whole horror genre? And yeah, I think that, I think we do pretty well. I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's interesting. So my last movie was, I'm not going to say the name, but like was distributed <laughs> by a different company oh. and, and no, not out of like, out of, I don't want to say something negative or positive, you know, I just don't want to come off that way. But basically like they were, they, that company was a bigger, bigger umbrella company and they, they're, they didn't have a lot of horror. My, my film uh, was called Domestic Hell. It's on available on Amazon Prime as we speak. But um, Domestic Hell was taken on by another, by not by Scream Time Films. Okay. What okay. I really have found, what I like about Scream Time Films is that Scream Time Films is sort of like more tapped into the horror audience because it has its own, you know, it's, it's been around for over 25 years. And so they have, they've, they've cultivated and curated like an audience for themselves. So when I do a movie, it's sort of already interjected into that community. Uh, Whereas with, if you go to a separate distributor who let's say has dramas and sci-fi and comedy, and then, Oh, we also have horror. It's a little bit more like people have to kind of go go to you to find it and go, Oh wait, what's this? I'm, I'm used to this company having a drama or a crime, you know, a crime movie or something. Um, and sense. so it's, you know, I, it's really good to have that niche, you know? Yeah. That makes total sense. I, um, I, uh, I, you sent me a screener of the, uh, Remy's demons, the current picture. And, uh, I figured it out. I mean, I'm, I'm not very technologically, advanced, but I figured out how to get it on the TV and, uh, jumped into it. I actually started it up last night to, uh, to dive in. And when I was thinking horror film, I was thinking Friday, the 13th blood guts, everybody's getting killed. And I got probably half the way through this. And I, it's just not for me. I don't, I don't do, I don't do horror film. You know what I mean? Like I, I wasn't a big Friday the 13th guy. None of that stuff. Uh, that was my expectation. But when I got into it, there's a whole different world of what horror film means now. Like it's not, it's not all just murder and blood and everything everywhere. It's like psychological and like it's heavy duty. How, how do you come up with the premise for your, for your movies? How do you know what audience you want to go after? And how do you know what the hot ticket is? Is there like a buzz like right now in horror film, this is the way to go? Or is it, is it, um, just kind of something you're exploring. What are, what are you finding? Like, how do you, how do you come up with these ideas and these premises for your movies? Yeah. So it's interesting. Like, um, I, I don't, I'm not a huge proponent of like market driven, like art or, or, or film, um, in, in that I don't, I try not to think too much about like, okay, so like, what are the trends or what are those things? And, and again, nothing wrong with that. It's just not my sort of thing. Um, I sort of just go, I try to find things. I, I try to find a story or, or a character that I'm interested in and it just kind of melds out from there, you know? Sure. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I don't, I'm weird in that. And I've heard other filmmakers say this and so then there's others that, that are more market driven or, or interested in that. But, um, is that like, I'm kind of like, I'm more in it to sort of explore a story that I find fascinating. Okay. And so what an interesting take on, or an interesting angle on that is my, my, uh, my third to last movie, uh, bloody drama also available on Amazon prime. 
Uh, Bloody drama is more of like what you were talking about in terms of like, it was when, when that movie, I had just done my first movie, which was like ultra no budget, ultra crazy experimental kind of horror movie in the vein of like Blair Witch. Right. And then Scream Time came to me and said, Hey, we have a program here that we, you know, if you want, you can make a film for us. And I said, oh, okay, uh, what's that about? So they said, well, we, we send you our premises and then you make them yours. And they go, from that point on, we don't, we don't manipulate you or tell you oh, how to do it. The we idea. just tell you. Yeah. So they gave me a, a slasher. I never in a million years thought I would do a slasher. <laughs> um, and, and that's not a knock on the, on the genre. It's, it's just, I, that's not right. something I ever thought I would do. Um, I think there's some awesome ones. Halloween's an, a masterpiece. It's a, it's one of the greatest horror movies ever made and it's a slasher, you know? Right. Um, there's even elements of, of Friday the 13th, the early ones that are really cool and really good. Freddy Krueger, amazing. You know, some of those movies are made. And so, I got the the synopsis and I really like delved through it. And I was like, man, I don't know. So I made it my own, whatever. But um, my point is, is that that was a different experience because I was kind of like in a way hired to make a film. Whereas it was every other film I've made has been my own conception where I'm like, I just sit around dreaming up. And right. honestly, like I'll, I'll tell you a short story is I'm, um, you know, a few, my, my son's seven years old. So when he was about two years old, you know, we always read to him at bedtime. And I was reading them one night and I thought to myself, I said, I think that I think the thing for me with cinema is I think I've always been a storyteller. Um, and that's what attracts me to cinema. And I know that sounds kind of like it's like, well, of course, everybody, you know, but in, the reality is a lot. We're all drawn to it for different reasons. There are people drawn to it that are like that love the visualization process of a film. Then there are people who are drawn to it that love um, the effects or, or building worlds. I right. think for me, it's just like, I just base I just, I just really love story. I, I honestly could work at Barnes and Noble telling stories in the back room <laughs> for, you know what I mean? Like, sure. like for five buck tips or something. <laughs> like I just, I love storytelling and I, I think it's just that it's the greatest, one of the greatest things human beings came up with or whatever. Sure. And, um, and so I just kind of dream up stuff and that's my favorite. I'm in the, right now I'm writing a film with a, with a writer out of, out of San Antonio here with me named Daniel Palmer and same thing, you know, we just dreamed up a crazy premise and we're just right now sculpting it. And it's like so much fun because we just can do whatever we want. How long know, does that process take? Like I generally, how long does that process take? Like to, from, from, you know, your conception to we're starting filming, like how long does that take? Well, yeah. Um, well, all right. So with, it's been different with each one, but to bloody drama was really fast. When he gave me that concept, I wrote it, uh, almost alone. I, I did get help from Ivy lamb who, who then since bloody drama, I've co-wrote domestic hell and Remy's demons. I've a hundred percent co-wrote those films. I just like, I realized writing alone is fine, but for me, I really like collaborating and talking to somebody and bouncing ideas off of them. Whereas if you're alone, really, you just go, Hey, Darren, read my script. Tell me what you think. Yeah. And you go, I like this. I don't like that. Whereas if I'm writing with someone, it's like, they go, I, I, I hear what you're saying about that overall concept, but I think we should bring oh, in this more whole real new world time. of character. Yeah. Yeah. More real time. That's cool. I, I get that. I, you know, cause when we do podcast stuff, I generally have a, a couple of co-hosts in and it's just nice to have that real interaction instead of you just sitting there thinking, Oh, this is great. And then you go down a complete line and then you let somebody read it and they're like, dude, that shit. And then you're like, Oh man, I got to go all the way back. You know, or if I would have known in real time, I could have jumped in, you know, into some other idea. So, so when you're uh, doing uh, like the, the films where they're, they're giving you an idea to run with, that's almost like um, probably more challenging, right? Because now you have something you have to focus on, and, you know, have to build on where, when it's your own thing, you could do whatever you want. I mean, the sky's the limit, right? Yeah. And it's like, I, a long, long time ago, I mean, honestly, all the way back till I think I was like 19, I got, um, I was working for a photographer in New York city. That's where I went to film school. And he was this like high end fashion photographer and he, and he was a Vietnam, um, 
conscientious objector. So he wrote this crazy book. His life is insane. In the 80s and 90s, he was, or 80s, he was like this big fashion photographer. Anyway, my, my reason for bringing the story up is that he, he came to me and said, hey, you, you're like a film student. Would you write a script for my, my memoir? He, he wrote a memoir that was like this big. And I was like, and, and I said, yeah, sure. And I remember, I'll never forget that process because I remember I loved every second of it because I read his book. I had to read his book and then transfer it into a, a script. It was probably a steaming pile of poop. Don't get me <laughs> wrong. But but I remember, and I, at my point of what you're saying is like, I will never turn down opportunities in any regard in that way because they're always growth. So like I, you know, when Scream Time asked me like, hey, would you make a movie with us? I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah. You know, like I, I was like, what, a, like you said, like what a challenge, what a cool thing to like have somebody offer an idea to you and then you got to run with it. Well, and I don't know, you know, I know, yeah. I know, um, um, Jason, the owner over there, I know that he, he, he loved the movie bloody drama. I'd always, I, I've never really talked to him more in depth about, cause it was his idea about what he, you know, if he broke it down, like did he, how different was it than what he in his mind thought saw? Cause he's a filmmaker too. You right. know, he makes films. So like, it'd be curious to see him go like him, tell me like, Hey man, I, I, uh, you made bloody drama over here. I thought it was going to be over here. You know? <laughs> like, I don't oh, know. I got you. I got you. Wow. That's interesting. And then, so when you're doing these old ones, like, uh, Remy's demons, how, uh, who's paying for that? Like, how are you, how are you funding this adventure? Is this all self-funded and, and you're, you're covering everything? Um, no. So, um, what, what I generally do is, um, for bloody drama, I was, I was funded by, by an amazing entrepreneur out of New Jersey named Joey Espinoza. He owns, um, PTY, uh, lighting. And, um, he, I, I, sh I shot commercials for him over the years, all this stuff. So I just actually just hit him up and I said, Hey, is there any way you invest in this? And he was like, sure. Wow. You know, he, he just, well, cause he always, he's known me forever. And I think he, he, he valued, he was like, I, 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 I know you and, and, and I think you deserve a shot, you know, since then I've, I've had no funding. Um, I basically do an Indiegogo campaign. We raised for, um, domestic hell. We raised about, uh, I think 1300, like, no, it was about $1,600, um, for that through a bunch of different people. Sure. Um, online and then on on um, on Remy's Demons, uh, we got about a thousand dollars from um, Colin Chinchar, who's my sort of partner in crime. He's done every movie with me. He's also he does all the our deal is not deal, but like our relationship collaboration is. I do the, all the filming and shooting and editing and all that. He does all the sound design and all the music. So all okay. the music in my films is is 98 percent colin chinchar um and and like i said he's also an executive producer because he's he's helps finance he has a real uh a um a jewelry store in uh oregon so you know it's it's, it's i mean like i said we are truly no budget i mean we are working my last two movies have been budgets domestic hell and remy's demons were under three thousand dollars wow um yeah and then to to pull off a feature film that's over 90 minutes generally um, on that kind of money is, is really hard. You know, I mean, you have to think like I, I, and, and I pay, you know, I don't, I don't take any of the money myself for myself. Right. So I pay the actors um, every day they show up, I pay them something, you yeah. know, like I, I just don't, I don't want, you know, and, not, and not that I pay any, anything that's worth, I mean, sure. They've always been like, it barely cuts the surface, but I just something. don't like the idea of someone showing up for free. Right. You know, it, I, I wouldn't do it. So no, that makes sense. That makes sense. I, I, I was curious. And when I was watching that film, I'm, you know, there's a lot of different uh, sets and a lot of different areas and different actors. And it's like, you know, putting all that together is, is a feat in itself. And then when you've got no money to offer, you know, that's a whole different bag of bolts. How's the back end of it? Like once it does get on Amazon prime, is that they cut you a check and you don't hear from them again? Or do you get a check every time it's downloaded or how does that process work? Like, I, I, I don't know the backside of the, you know, I pay my prime bill once a year and I watch what I want to watch, but how does that work from your end then? Are you making any money or, or is there any, or is it that you're starting out and you're just having to cut your teeth and get, you know, get the exposure rather than worry about the money? 
So there, there are Phil, I do not make any money, but there are Phil, I, I, I make under, um, I think, um, with screen time, um, I've, you know, I've made under, uh, you know, I don't know, 700 bucks, let's say. I know it's under a thousand, right? And it, it's, the whole thing about Amazon is it's all about, they, they, they pay you per, per view per second, I think, or per minute. Now there's some oh. of my, by the way, there's someone listening to this where I'm probably wrong. Feel free to correct us in the comments <laughs> or whatever. I, I don't know it exactly. I know that it's, it's, but it is, it is a, you get paid X amount per, per view per set. Like, you know, when you, when you watch on. Remy's demons on prime, it'll, it'll count as an X amount. Now that rate is very, very, very low. Right. So the way to make money is you'd have, you have to have million, you know, a million, two million, four million views. And, and there's other avenues, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's other filmmakers out there that have done quite successful. Um, to be honest with you, I mean, I, you know, of course, obviously every, you know, I want to make enough money to survive and, and for this to be something that I can survive off of doing, um, it's not that yet. But what it is, is it's, I've been telling people, I went to film school in the 90s, early to mid 90s. Um, I've been telling friends and everything that this, this, this new world for me of doing these movies the last eight years is, is like my, new, my second film school. And so it's been, it's been really awesome. Like, and, and I, I, I don't plan on stopping and, and I'm, I definitely am not going to let budgets kind of get in my way at this point. I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, obviously like, I guess my model is that the hope is that, you know, I don't want to say I get recognized, but I, you know, the hope is that by doing your show and getting myself out there and getting these films out there that someone will come along and say, you know, Hey, you yeah. know, we're, we're, we're looking to invest. And, and there's also like, my final thing on that is, is that, um, my belief is that I don't really like, I, I would love to do with the Avengers five, you know, but, but at the same time, like the world I'm in right now, I think for an investor, there's this amazing world where as long as, you know, if you could keep your budgets under 30, 40, 50,000 and make a quality story, there's a really good revenue stream that could exist there. Oh, wow. So it's, but it's getting people to see that. Cause I think the movie industry is more seen as like Avengers or, or, or even, um, you know, low budget independent films, but those low budget independent films are still a million, $2 million budgets, you know? Um, I think there's this amazing area where an investor could come in, swoop in and go, I'm going to give, I, I have about a hundred K to play with. Hey now. The, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so the all of, yeah. And so all of a sudden you, you can make four movies for a hundred K Yeah, and then, and then, you know, emphasize social media and emphasize doing your show and things like this and raising awareness. And, and actually, if you can get those views up to 5 million, 10 million people watch the YouTube video, then there'll be a return on investment. So do you, so do you have a, uh, do you have a, uh, you know, 25,000, $50,000 movie in mind once you do achieve that budget? Or is that, you know, just something you'll cross when you get to that uh, bridge or is there like, you know, I've got one in the back of my head that's a, uh, that, but it's going to take 50 to 75 K to get it done. And you're just kind of sitting on it till the money rolls in, or is it, uh, is it just, uh, you know, we'll see when we get there and make it the, you know, at the time. I mean, what uh, you got to have a well, couple, uh, you got to have a couple in the back of the old burner just waiting to come out. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it's interesting. Um, the way I project going forward for me, because I, I feel like I'm at a crossroads. You know, this is, like I said, this is my sixth no-budget movie. And um, and I'm not going to stop, right? So I'll give you an example. So when I, I came up with the idea for our new film, um, the new script, and when I when I talked to Daniel about writing it with me, um, I told him, I said, Daniel, like, because he's a, he's a budding, he's a very young guy, wants to be a screenwriter, like it's his dream, right? And I told him, I said, Daniel, why don't we do this? Let's write two versions of this script. Let's write the the money version where we can expand the universe and play with yeah. visual effects and whatever. And then let's do the Colin Bressler, no budget version. <laughs> and so we are, we're literally writing uh, almost two parallel universes in this story. Now they're not that varied. I don't want to paint a picture. Like it's like two scripts that are, that can't live together. The same character, same storyline. It's just that 
you know, there's a sci-fi element to it. So like this one version, we can show flying cars and whatever, right? This version, <laughs> no flying cars. They're in a living room talking. Right, you know? right, right. So okay. it's like, it's that dynamic. It's kind of like, I always kind of like, um, actually until this script, this new script, um, every other movie I've done, I've always started out with the premise of what can happen in a small confined set of spaces. And then I make a movie based, you know, sure. um, I start out as no budget, but I love that question. Cause it's so true. It's like, but yeah, the answer to it is yes. I, I have, um, I have about four scripts on the burner, uh, not counting the one that I'm working on now um, that are done in the can. And, and, you know, I do like the script. There's their script competitions. So I do those with some of them to try to gain awareness. One of my, one of my scripts, uh, one, uh, quarterfinals at uh, Austin Film Festival um, and stuff like that. You just got to like, you got to kind of um, throw everything at every dartboard and hope that you hit the bullseye. I mean, for sure, you know, you can't be, you can't limit yourself in any way because you've got to just be like, I, uh, you know, and this is what, how we met was, you know, I, 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 I came in all this and I said, I, I need to get exposure and I need to get out there. I mean, no one knows who I am. And, and, and so I met Steven Joyner and, and the rest is history. Sure. And here I am with Darren. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that crazy? It's a smaller world than it you is. think. That's for sure. What about, uh, so give people a breakdown, your current film, Remy's demons, give people uh, a breakdown of what the, what the idea is, the story, you know, give us, give us the 15 second elevator pitch. Cause I don't want to butcher it. Cause I, no, no, that's fine. I, uh, I think you probably know it better than anybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, Remy's Demons is a, this is my, my way of saying it. Remy's Demons is a coming of, a coming of age uh, horror love story. It's a coming of age horror love story. Um, and so it's about, it follows the story of Remy, who is a, uh, of about 38 to 45 year old man on the spectrum the, the Asperger's autism spectrum, who's being raised by uh, Stephen King's Carrie's mother, the, the mother that raised Carrie and Stephen King's <laughs> Carrie. Um, that, that, is, I, I, that is literally the genesis of the project. Mm -hmm. um, it started out where I, I literally was in between movies and I saw Carrie was on and I was watching it. And that mother character just kind of like really blew me away. And I was like, what if, and it just kind of starts with all these what ifs, you know? Sure. But yeah, that, that's it. So it's kind of like, you know, what Re Remy and his mother are, um, they're into the occult and witchcraft and conjuring demons and all kinds of fun stuff. And, um, and so, you know, you, Remy has this very specific life that he set up for himself. And the story of this movie is how, how does he deal with things that, fall apart within that structure and how does he build that structure back up where he feels comfortable or does he at all or can he is that it, it, it did you play remy i did not no huh i thought maybe no jason scarborough did just i know right he get, well it's not I, so dark but but um um i'm nowhere near as handsome as jason scarborough <laughs> i want to make that i want to make that clear to the audience um the guys the guys uh, he's a looker i'll just say that but um <clears throat> But yeah, I, I uh, Jason Scarborough uh, played uh, Remy in Remy's Demons. Uh, again, the film was filmed in San Antonio, Texas. Um, he is uh, like the thing is, I, I I know. So you're sitting there watching it. Hopefully, people at home will will go to Prime and watch it once it's on Amazon Prime. And you're watching this movie, and you'll see these actors. And the thing I I I I wish people could see, and it would totally ruin the movie experience. Maybe at the end it happens, but like. Jason and, and Aisha Love plays Vera and Magda Porter plays Regan and Angelita Aron Sorensen plays Mildred and Ronald Mercado plays Robin. Uh, those are the five kind of key characters. It's like what I put them through to make these movies is <laughs> so it's not only they're in hot environments, they're in cold environments. They're in, we shot this movie almost a year it took. Um, wow. We had a, yeah, we had an actor uh, uh, bail out to play Remy initially, um, who was cast to play him. I had shot a few scenes and then, it, you know, whatever, life came and he couldn't do the rest. I had to recast. Jason came along, thank God, because Jason was a miracle. But the thing is, like, like, I don't know if how where you are of this, but like, 
these guys, like they have this script and then I'm literally calling them and going, Hey, can you guys shoot next Tuesday from 9am to four? Uh, okay. And I wow. send them five scenes and then they meet me and they shoot. And then it's like, they might not hear again from me for three weeks. Wow. And so for why I bring up like Jason, particularly as Jason had to play uh, someone on the spectrum and he has personal experience with people on the spectrum. And I remember when he first got brought on to the project, he told me, he said, Colin, I, I'm not, I can't do a caricature, man. It's gotta be real. Yeah. It's gotta be, it's gotta feel real and it can't be some cheese. I, I can't, I'm not making fun of people and I'm not going to be like, like I'm doing a caricature is the best way to say it. But like, you know, and, and I told him, I said, man, I appreciate that. Cause I don't want, I, I I'm glad you're saying that. Cause I don't want that. But my point is he had to like stay in this character for like eight months <laughs> in and out, you know, I and, thought he did a this, good job and, and you're going to watch, you'll see the whole movie and you'll see like for an actor, he, he gave a very consistent performance, but it looks like it looks very easy and natural, but it's like the guy did that over the course of almost a calendar year Wow, <laughs> on and off. That's a huge commitment to make on the, on the uh, huge budget that you have. That was uh, that was a good find that he would commit to that, and 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 he did a great you know he did a great job from from what I saw, and uh, I, I got to imagine that's a tough sell from your standpoint. Like, hey, you know, you want to be in this? I can't pay much, and it's going to take forever. But in the end, you know, it it you know we're going to have a feature film. I mean, so I, obviously there's some incentive there because you know everybody's got to get seen, everybody's got to get out there, and they got to start somewhere. So it's really a, a a neat opportunity. Is this is this your full time gig? Do you do you uh, do you have a day job? Do you do other things, or is this uh, is this everything we're all in? Yeah. So I'm a I'm a professional cameraman. Um, I, I went to film school, and so that's my job, right? So I I show up to to TV. I do particularly documentaries and um and reality TV. That's my job, right? So so yeah. I mean, I'll I'll just be I'll be on a TV show and then I'll, I'll let's say two week long shoot. I'll do a two week long shoot somewhere and then I get home and then I'll do a day on Remy's, you know? Yeah. And then I'll go back on a shoot somewhere. So yeah, my, my, my day job is a cameraman for, for reality television and, and uh, documentary stuff and, and corporate video, all kinds of stuff. But yeah, how is, yeah, how is that cameraman? Been? How's the reality TV world from the cameraman perspective? It's amazing. It's crazy. It's insane. It's, um, I mean, this, the, the things that we are exposed to and the things that we experience. And, and, uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on. It's, it's just, it's crazy. I love it so much. And, and, um, I, it's afforded me so many cool experiences in my life that I, I just wouldn't have had. Sure. And then, you know, and, and, and then it gets to be on TV. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, you know, I used to shoot movies and stuff. Um, and I, and I still do every now and again, but, um, and what I mean is I'm a cinematographer on the movie. Um, but I kind of twisted into documentary and, 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 uh, reality TV. So what is so awesome. I mean, it's, what have you worked on? You got to do some name dropping, like anything big. Um, well, I, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll let you be the judge of if it's big, but, um, um, right now, um, I, the show, the main show that I do is, um, 600 pound life for TLC. Oh, uh, that's, oh. that's got a yeah, huge that's, following. That's, the, <laughs> that's a big show. Yeah. 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 No, I know. I know. But what it's a actually, crazy um, it's premise. Funny. It's funny because that show 600 pound life, um, you know, I've been doing television for almost 20 years and I've done all kinds of stuff, history channel shows, all this stuff. But the only show that ever gets the well, two shows I've done, there's one of the two shows is 600 everywhere I go. People are like, you do 600. Yeah. Did you ever work with Megan or did you ever, you know, it's like, I'm always, really? I'm always like, Holy crap. This, this show is huge. Well, you know, and I had uh, run into a guy at a local establishment here, uh, oh, two, three years ago, probably five years ago. And he was a discovery channel guy, uh, for, for the same kind of thing you do. And he's like, I'll go work for two weeks and then I'll be home for two weeks and I'll be gone for two weeks. And he goes that it works, you know, but it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, but I, I yeah. just think it's a fascinating, a fascinating world. And now that reality TV is obviously not always reality, but uh, to see the backside of that's got to be something. I mean, 
six hundred pound <laughs> life is got quite a following, but it's uh, it's a different uh, it's a different setup. It's a different world. But what what other ones have you uh, uh, been involved with? Uh wow, so many. I mean, I did. Um, I'm just reeling off recently stuff. Um, I don't know if you're aware. Facebook has a reality show with uh, Mike Rowe. No, remember the Dirty Jobs guy. Oh yeah, I know him. I know what, he's a big. Yeah, no, guy. it's crazy, and they get two million views. But Facebook has a show. Very rarely do people know about it, but it's uh, it's Mike Rowe. It's um, it's about giving back. Um, it's a really nice, like heartfelt show. Um, so I've been working on that on and off here and there. Um, I've done some stuff with Thrillist, uh, the online where restaurant reviews. I go and shoot restaurant reviews. It's a really, oh, really? A ton of fun. That sounds uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. They just send me out. It's it's and it, the way they do it is brilliant because it's it's so lo-fi and like bang bang bang. And um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I I did Martha Stewart show back in '99 to about 2005. Is that the one? Uh, with, no, is that the one with Snoop? Is that the one with Snoop? No, 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 no. I uh, I did her original show like oh. way back. Oh, sure, cool. So so obviously that one you're going to the same location all the time, but. But like for the Mike Rowe thing or or for the 600 pounder deal, is that like throw the camera uh, in the bag and you head out and show up and film? And because they're not all in your town. So you're just you'll, exactly. be, you'll be gone for a stretch and, and film it out. And then and then uh, when it's done, it's done. Are you? Yeah, are, they, you're not they, editing. They, they have it um, done where it's like runs. You know, they'll send a crew out for three days, five days, eight days. And then and then you come back home and then, you you know usually you're, you're off for a little bit and then you go back out. So yeah, they do it that way. Um, I also did, um, did you ever see the show shipping wars? Yeah. 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 I, I did that. I, I, did, was, uh, I did storage wars briefly too, actually. No shit. That was pretty staged. Wasn't it? Storage wars. Uh, so- uh I'm not going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not commenting on any of that. No, it's, uh, I don't want to be on the record for any comments about whether or not things are real or no, not. that's probably a good idea. I, uh, no, I was a huge, <laughs> uh, storage wars pe- uh, person when it first came out and then, uh, the, sh- uh, shipping wars you said, right? Yeah. So that was the one where the dude died. Uh, yeah. Haggerty looking dude. What a weird lifestyle that is just living on the road pulling cra- and the weirdest shit they would find to have to move around. It was like, how does that even happen? But I'm guessing there's a whole shipping underworld, which you guys obviously dug into, but it was, it was that was actually a, a decent show for, you know, you could just tune in and forget about everything else for a while. And so you probably have seen quite a bit of the country with that, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. That show. I mean, multiple times we went from Florida to California. Um, I did, like three or four runs like that. We did runs up across the the northern part of the country from like Chicago to California. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, I mean that was I I loved it. I mean when it when that show stopped filming, we were we were anyone of all involved who was so bummed because it was so it was so much fun. The crew and the producers and everybody involved were so awesome. So that was a bit of a bummer. That that was about I think it did about a five year run, and I was primarily doing it. I I didn't. I, that's all I wanted to do. So I just did that for forever. But, um, but so yeah, is that, that, is that was, how that it works awesome then one. you get, you get on one and when it hits, then you're on that one till it's off or, or they bounce you around. Generally, generally, I mean, you know, it, it, it obviously depends on the person. I mean, they, you know, these are very grueling experiences, generally speaking. I mean, you're, you're long hours. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of turnover, but, but yeah, I mean, if it goes well and you happen to be on the ground floor of a, of a pilot season or, or whatever, um, you, you know, they'll generally, unless you're not good or you do a bad job or something, you know, they'll generally kind of keep you on. Um, you know, and I did, um, I did the Deion Sanders, uh, Oprah, uh, own network, uh, reality show. Oh, really? Um, and on, yeah. And on that one, I, I started out as a camera op, but then I, the season two, I became the director of photography, which is like a big bump up. Wow. And, uh, it was pretty cool. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like I, but I, you know, it's cause I was on season one and they trusted me, you know, it's just that kind of thing. So there, there's, there's definitely like, you know, once you've been on a show that's successful. Yeah. I mean, there's people, I mean, I'm sure there's people that are on the bachelor that probably <laughs> been on that show from day one Really? or survivor or oh. even survivor. Maybe. I don't know for a fact. I'm just saying, 
you got a cash cow like that, a kind of show that's super popular that keeps shooting. Most people go, Hey, I'll just keep calling me. I'm coming back. Well, and that's just it. So are you, you're a network guy then not a, uh, uh, a show or are you a show like, uh, like the survivor people, do they work for, what is it? CBS. I don't even know who has that. Um, do they work? Yeah. And then, and then, so when that ends, CBS sends them somewhere else, or do you work for a company that, you know, has... no, we're all freelance. Okay. It's all freelance. So it's like, it's, you know, you just get called, Hey, we're doing this show called survivor. You're going to travel to a desert Island somewhere and you're going to shoot for whatever 50 days. Yeah. Okay. You wow. go and do it. And then, you know, you're on contract by some smaller subsidiary company production company that is produ- co-producing it with CBS or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it, you know, um, it's, it's, there's not a lot um, of, of sort of staff type positions in what I do. Yeah. It's generally speaking either permalance or, or freelance. So then is it, is it, uh, is it consistent? Like you're full time as much as you want to be, or is it, you have to reach a certain level to get that? Is it, is it, is it like, it's not a, a, I don't want to say not a normal job, but it's not, you know, there, there aren't a lot of people in your industry, I should say, because it's, it's, you know, obviously it's a unique business where, you know, not everything needs a camera operator. And, uh, and yeah, generally with the way the world is right now with, with TV shows and, uh, reality and all the documentaries and stuff, there's a lot of extreme stuff being filmed right now, which I mean, like if you could get on the deadliest catch or, or survivor, I mean, those are, they've been on forever, which obviously you're, you're in extreme conditions at that point, but what a, what a fascinating job that has to be a ton of fun, but I suppose just like anything, it's got the downside. I mean, when you're stuck in the back of a truck on driving from Florida to California, that ain't, that ain't no fun, but yeah, it, exactly. I mean, there, you know, every job is, as has, I mean, there are certain jobs that, um, I do, um, Comic-Con every year, oh. um, in San Diego, best, sure. my favorite job of the year. Right. I mean, that's like the weather is insane. It's like 75, 80 degrees every day. Gorgeous. Yeah. Um, my hotel's usually on the water on the beach and I have this insane view out my window. I've done 15 years of, of Comic-Con. And um, so that's a job that's, you know, we just inter- I, I, I go for five days. I, I interview celebrities all day of shows that I watch, by the way, Walking <laughs> Dead or whatever. Right. So like I get to meet all these amazing people that I that I worship, you know, Breaking Bad. But, um, so you have jobs like that and then you have other, then you have jobs that are, you you know, are very grueling and hard, you know, and they're not a lot of fun. Yeah. So it's just kind of like, it's just different, you know, it just varies. And I think that's, that's what it draws, you know, it, it, it draws people, um, this industry draws or, or this field draws people to that are kind of like, don't really want to have a stagnant kind of, or a, or a similar day of, of work every day. Right. They don't feel ultra comfortable with comfortability. <laughs> um, um, and so it's <laughs> definitely not for that, you know, it's for people who are, who kind of want to be always in a different environment. And, and even within one shoot, you could wake up one day and it's like a, a blizzard and you have to shoot in it too bad. Yeah. Or it's 107 degrees. And it's like, I'm sorry, on the Dion show, we were out on football fields in the middle of the summer in Texas and it was 102, 104 degrees. And we're out there with the football players Man. for hours. Brutal. That's hard. That's tough. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's the, that's the side you don't think of when you think of the, uh, you know, the cameraman, the, the showbiz jobs, there is some ugly side too. Wow. That's crazy. So that's tell- all I think about too. If I see a, if I see a show with like crazy snow or like crazy weather conditions, I always, I, I don't see the show. I see, I'm like the guy holding that camera that I'm watching right now. I'm like, oh, that guy must have been so freaking cold. <laughs> That's, how I kinda... That's so true. I, uh, I, uh, I, I've started to, to get that way. Like I, I do uh, voiceover commercials and, and obviously, oh, nice. and obviously the podcast. And then I have a, a real job that, uh, feeds me, but, uh, yeah, You know, even with the voiceover, when you start to hear commercials and you start to hear stuff, it's like, oh, you know, I know what they're doing there, but nah, that didn't, you know, so, so you do start to, to interpret things a little differently when you see them. So I imagine you see a lot of different stuff that you're like, <laughs> look what they had to go through to get that shot. That's great. Oh, I know. I, well, I know. And I always, um, you know, I always like my wife, you know, 
it's been we've been married for over 12 years and it's like she um 13 years sorry and she you know like she knows so i'll tell her stuff you know we'll be watching something and i'll tell her i'll be like i don't even know how they got the crew to that location <laughs> little you know i'm like i'm like it looks amazing but i'm like god that must have been hor- like what a horrible experience just to yeah. get people to wow. the place where the guy's standing there with a sword in a field you know <laughs> i'm like but this is when anyone in the business that I do, you know, they, they, that's, we can't get out of our heads, but you know, the same thing is I've talked to people that are accountants or whatever, and they watch a movie with accounting and they can't get past right. how wrong it is. Right. They're like, then nobody works like that. You know, like, yeah. I think we all do it. It's just in our different ways, you know, For it's sure. like you look at it and you're like, you're like, that's not realistic. Like that, 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 that a cop doesn't act like that or whatever, you know, like we're all kind of probably analyze this stuff that way. Oh, I'm sure. I, I, uh, I know I do it. I, um, oh, we got to wrap this thing up. What, uh, tell everybody when we're going to be able to see, uh, Remy's demons on Amazon prime and how we can find all of your other stuff. You got social media, you got website. Let's hear it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So, uh, Remy's demons is right now available on Amazon prime, Barnes and noble.com TCM, uh, Turner classic movies.com and a few other places, if you're into the DVD market, if you still collect DVDs, that's awesome. Um, they, it is available there um, to buy right this moment. Um, as far as uh, the prime streaming, uh, we're just waiting in the process. It's, it's eminent. It should be any day now. Uh, and I can go to your page and update if it comes out after this. But, sure. but yeah, um, so it'll be there. My other films, Domestic Hell, Bloody Drama, Sleepover, Sandra's Revolution are available on Amazon Prime. So I love it if you go check them out, put a review and feel free to contact me at um, uh, Facebook. I'm Colin Bressler on Facebook or on Instagram. I'm at Bressler Productions on Instagram. Um, and Instagram, if you're on Instagram, please join me, follow. And because and, I post a ton of updates, but also I, I post cool stuff on set and pictures and all kinds of stuff. Um, I do a lot of, I, I get a lot of graphic design stuff done by brilliant graphic design people to put some cool looking stuff up and, um, yeah. And go to scream time films, check out their movies. If you're really a horror buff, they have amazing independent, you know, low budget, independent horror movies. Um, and, uh, and again, Darren, thank you so much for having me. This you has bet, been man. awesome. You were like, it's super smooth and easy talking to you. So that's, that's awesome. Well, that was we, fun. we will get a link on, uh, on our website and, uh, this, uh, you know, this will, uh, probably be, uh, the one that, that blows your thing up, you know, being on the DK project is, uh, going to do awesome things for your film. I just could tell, thank you. I could just tell actually, no, I, uh, I, uh, I'll get it out there everywhere I can and we will, uh, get the, get the word out with a link and, uh, make some magic happen, man. I love it. Hey, thanks a lot for the time, Colin. And we will, uh, we'll Thank check you. in with you periodically to see what's happening in the old film booth and, uh, what's been going on. So we'll check Please in with do. you somewhere Please down do. the road. All Please right. Do. Thank you so much. Take care, man. That's it. That's the end. That's a wrap. Read the shtick. That's a wrap for today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and tell all your friends. If you'd like to reach out, you can use the studio line at 612-504-6500 or by email, the DK Project Podcast at gmail.com. And of course, there's always social media at the DK Project Podcast. Thanks for tuning in.